fight. Scene so, one, take one A, soft sticks. Today is November uh, 15th, 2019. And could you just give me your name real quick? Brian Ferguson. And how would you like your title for the end credits? Um, Charlie Tuna's youngest son, Okay. I would say. And spelt just the way it is? Yes. Yeah, it's and are you giving us permission to use this footage? Yes. Okay, very good. Do you want to start? No. Uh, yeah, just tell us what, what it was like, you know, growing up with a dad who was such an iconic figure in the uh, 60s L.A. scene. Well, I came pretty far after the 60s. Uh, I was born in 1980, so, <laughs> you know, going, going backwards in time, I can only really remember what my brothers and sisters and my mom have, have told me. Um, my father, Charlie Tuna, wasn't one to really brag about himself that much. He never wrote a book, and um, he was just too humble to do that about himself. So, um, uh, if I can mention that, that's one of the things that I'm doing is I'm uh, going backwards in time and uh, revisiting old family and friends and coworkers and sort of rediscovering my dad uh, through them. So did your dad recognize the gravity of his position as he was rising? I think he recognized the gravity of his position right when he had to make this, this let me take that again. <laughs> I think he realized the gravity of his role as a, a personality when he had the decision to either go to New York or L.A. Um, and out of a whim, he just chose L.A. because of the weather. Wow, that's a good whim. Yeah, I mean, it, it changed my life. <laughs> you know, I, it, it would have been a completely different life in New York, that's for sure. During what you could remember from, I mean, you were born in the 80s. He was already, you know, he was so established by the time the mm -hmm. 80s came. But trying to back up from what you know in the, in the 70s, uh, where I knew him, like, like he, was, he was it. He was Spotify, he was Pandora's box. He was, he was, he was everything that had to do with uh, music. What can you relate from those years, those early years in LA? Meaning, can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, what, 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 what did he think his impact on that era was? I think the way that he saw his impact when he was in L.A., uh, it was non-existent. It was just you're doing your job, you're having the greatest time of your life, and you were hitting the best ratings. I don't think he realized the global impact of his his legacy later on in life. Did he model himself after somebody? What was his inspiration? Oh my gosh, there was this one, I can't remember his name, I'll have to get his name. I wish I remembered his name. Was he, was he an announcer too? He was a radio personality in the, uh, growing up in the 40s and the 50s, but radio personalities back in the, that era, in the 40s and 50s, they had this stern, you know, very uh, political, you know, analysis of uh, these events. And it was mostly news and, you know, stories. Uh, they, they, I think they did, you know, acting on radio. And um, this was before, obviously, television uh, exploded. But, um, uh, I feel like I was going to go with that one. <laughs> I know what you mean, that was stoic. These guys were like... Right, yeah, they were very stoic. And I don't think it was until uh, KHJ where my dad or any other, any other celebrities like Robert W. Morgan, uh, Sam Riddle, Humble Harve, Real Don Steele, um, they got to develop their personalities on air for the first time ever. 
And this ultimately became like your best friend telling you what's the coolest new song that you want to listen to over and over again. And I guess you can say it was like the first social network where you had interaction between fans and the celebrities. It was way before Twitter. Wow. So that so he was riding the wave of that social it's like it was it was an upheaval, it was an impact. It was literally driving clubs, driving music, driving not only teenagers, but you know, the what was his age what was his age range and who did who was he impacting? He was impacting everyone from teenagers to 20s, 30s, that demographic. I mean, it was mostly young kids. And I think that's what most of music really aspires to cater to. Um, you know, you think of the biggest pop stars now and they're, they're just kids themselves, you know. Um, and to have someone older tell you, like, it was like an older brother, an older sister, telling you what was cool and what was not. My sister told me what was cool and what was not when I was growing up. I mean, that's how I got into Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains and the you know, 90s grunge scene. Um, I followed her lead because I was like, this sounds good. She likes it. She's in my family. This, is, must, must, this must be awesome. And it was, and I really loved it. And um, I think back in those days in the 60s and 70s when there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, when, when television was just starting to emerge, um, these were your best friends in the car. These were the guys that were just in the back seat going like, oh dude, check this, check this new song out. Like, oh, now you can call in and request a song? Like, that was crazy, you know? Like, that was the first time anyone has ever done that. Like, I think KHJ was the first station in LA to do that. Don't quote me on that, but you gotta yeah. fact check that. <laughs> What were some of the stunts that he was pulling uh, to promote himself? Oh man, uh, one of the stunts that he told me that he did was he was giving away a house. And they did a promo where there was a picture of him sitting on the house. And uh, I can't, yeah, that was, I can't, I can't remember the full story on that though. But there was, yeah, there was, a, there was like this, there was a weird house giveaway. Um, <laughs> Did you do anything with like packing uh, telephone booths? Right. Yeah, so an, an, another one of the, let me start with, uh, settle back into this. I think one of the most interesting ways that they were able to reach out to fans was when my dad deliberately packed himself full of, wait, hold on, let me start that over again. Um, that was my water, it's okay. Uh, like some of, the, some of the interactivity that the station used to do was my dad used to go out into the field, find a phone booth, and then this was way before cell phones, so you had to use a pay phone. And he called up the station, and the, he, he was on the air on the station and telling people, giving them clues as to where he was. And however many people fit in the phone booth got tickets to a concert, or they got tickets to see a movie, or, or what, you know, they, they got rewarded in some sort of weird way um, for finding him and listening. And that was like the whole ideas to get you to listen to the station constantly just in case there was one of these giveaways and there was um, other giveaways where people were driving on the freeway um, like there would be a, a radio personality driving on the freeway and they'd be like come and find me and jump in my car you know it'd be just crazy stuff like that it's incredible at, at, at what kind of magazines was he ending up in what kind of coverage was he getting was it was it something that um Put him on TV. So his career back in the 60s and 70s, uh, yeah, landed him uh, into a movie role back in the 70s. Uh, 
Let me serve that again. I said 70s too many times. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that radio brought him was a television career or a movie career. He was in the movie Roller Coaster uh, that came out in the late 70s. And he basically played himself uh, towards the end of the film. Uh, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but he was a radio, he played himself uh, giving away, a, doing a radio spot at a theme park, which was Magic Mountain at the time. And uh, that roller coaster was all about the roller coaster revolution um, that was supposed to go out of control and, and kill someone, or it was like a murder plot, weird story. But yeah, he was, he thoroughly, he thoroughly enjoyed the experience of working in, in movies, and ultimately that led him into doing television, which uh, he hosted game shows. He hosted Scrabble with Chuck Woolery. Um, yeah, he was, um, uh, well, there's some other game shows that he was on. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. His Wikipedia page is escaping me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he had at least a half a dozen game shows that he was on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, he was ultimately... He ended up doing like the night, the Tonight Shows too, Alan Thicke, I think he was... Yeah, he did, uh, he did Thick of the Night with Alan Thicke. He did a lot of things for Casey Kasem uh, back in the 80s. I remember going to, with him, I remember going with my dad to Casey's office on, I think it was Hollywood Boulevard, and, um, or where, wherever he was in Hollywood, and I would just be hanging out in the lounge where he had a secretary, and there was like two booths. It was just a, a radio booth and a control booth, and and I got to hear a little bit of my dad on the outside. I think it was maybe like six or seven at the time, but um, those really cool experiences were, you know, he's, he already had this respect and this uh, uh, sort of personality and candor and relationships with people that, you know, he was already established. And it, it wasn't until 1990 that he got his star in the Walk of Fame, which I was lucky enough to get pulled out of school for. So, how did he like having his his uh, star? He loved, yeah. He he loved having a star in the Walk of Fame. Um, he, anytime one of us kids said we visited it, uh, you know, he would ask, uh, "How does it look? Is it clean?" You know, <laughs> uh, and. Now that he's, uh, you know, he's since passed in 2016, but um, my uh, my sisters and my brother and I, we always kind of like joke around, like, uh, you know, how's the marker? Is it is it clean? Is it has it, has it look? You know. <laughs> but um, yeah, the last time I visited visited his star was maybe a few months ago, uh, but a lot's a lot's changed around that area since. Um, uh, they've been uh, in redevelopment. Yeah, it's all, you're going through a metamorphosis. Yeah. Um, what was your father to you, just in, in a relationship? How, how was your relationship with your dad? I thought my dad was the... Uh, let me see. Let me find a good way to word this. I think uh, growing up with him as a father, uh, there was something about him that was just colossal. Uh, he was stood about six one, six two, and he had this big booming voice, and it was so frightening to hear him yell. <laughs> just so frightening. Um, so you never wanted to upset him, um, but this one time I did upset him. And it was about sports, I remember. And um, I tr it was like the la I was like the last batter, the bases were loaded, and I tried to swing for the fence or something like that. I think I was like, t like 10, 10 or 12 years old, and um, he just didn't talk to me on the way home. And it was just like, ooh, god damn. And uh, he took me back to his studio, which was like, 
you know, the like you don't want to get a talk to dad in the studio because like that means it's like serious and um he was he was upset that I wasn't a team player. You know, like he just wanted me to get a base hit. He didn't want me to swing for the fence. And that's what he was his whole life. He was a team player through and through and I think that's why he had such a great established and successful career is because he led with integrity. He didn't lead with wealth. He led with his heart and it it pushed him through a lot of hard situations. Did he ever talk about the KHJ years when he came in 67? Yeah, yeah. Like? Yeah, the um he used to brag about a story where he uh Infamous night where it was the second night when the Doors played the Hollywood Bowl. He would, he introduced the Doors, and he just I remember him telling me this at dinner one time, like at a family dinner, because my sister was like, "Oh, tell Brian about the Doors story," you know. <laughs> and he you know he just he announced the Doors. He's like, "Ladies and gentlemen, the Doors," and then everyone applauded, and he walked right past Jim Morrison. And his eyes, like his eyes were just glazed over and he looked just gone. And I think that's when he jumped in the pool, like in the, in the pit pool. I'm not sure. Um, it, was, it was either the night before or that night. But um, yeah, he got to introduce the doors. Like that's just incredible. Um, he, there's an early picture of Michael Jackson um, as a kid uh, in his studio, which was... Um, really uh it's heartbreaking to see you know um but um there's a great picture of him with uh got all these celebrities came in you know jim henson frank oz um uh patrick swayze um all these, yeah, I can, I'm trying to think of the top ones right now. Oh. Uh, he probably did music stuff nonstop. That was his life. I mean, my mom always says, you know, she, my mom tells me stories all the time about just, that was the life. She stayed home with these little babies and he went to work and came home every once in a while and <laughs> asked for food. <laughs> You know, because he couldn't feed himself. <laughs> um, but yeah, he uh, he was very busy, even through my years. But one of the things that I think how I led a different life is I came 11 years later when his career was more established. So he could slow down a little bit. And um, he spent a lot of time with me on sports. So I played a lot of baseball, a lot of soccer. Um, a lot of basketball and I loved it I loved spending time with him that was our bonding experience with sports and um, I'll truly never forget all those memories that we had just driving to soccer practice all these tournaments you know he was he was the leader in my family the leader in the city for radio you know <laughs> like uh, it was hard growing up it was hard growing up with him <laughs> <laughs> Did people know who he was when you're doing these these events? Did they come up to him? Did people recognize that that was Charlie Tuna, or was he keeping a low profile? He always kept a low profile wherever he went. I think that's why he liked having the alternate radio name, Charlie Tuna, is because he could get away from radio and spend time with his family. You know, family was very important to him as well. And, um, you know, him working hard was just him going out for the kill and bringing back the, you know, the, the hunt. And um, that's how I, you know, see how he provided as a father. Um, but yeah, I remember going to, when I was growing up in grade school, I went to a private Catholic school. So went to church all the time and some people knew him some people knew that he was my dad or um, just kind of, it was low on the radar. Uh, 
but when he would talk, people would be like, I know you from somewhere. <laughs> and he'd be like, hello, I'm Charlie Tuna, you know, I just, how you doing? I'm on K-Hits or whatever station he was at at the time, you know? Uh, but uh, yeah, it wasn't, yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of promos with um, uh, headshots and all that back in the 80s. It really used to be a big thing in the 70s. There used to be all these different, you know, cards for uh, KHJ that promoted the radio station and the disc jockeys. Like, that never had been done before, where the station was intertwined with these personalities. Uh, it just seemed like such a good fit for what people really wanted, which was music. Right. You now, mentioned your dad was a team player when he was at KHJ with that team of you know, boss jock. Yeah. Did he ever share any stories with you about his interactions with them? Were they jealousies? Were they were they a big family? Did they do crazy stuff? You know, what, what happened during that period of the 60s? Uh, when yeah. KHJ? Well, the late, I, I, I think I equate that era, the late 60s, early 70s, at KHJ to be sort of like a high school. You know, there was these freshmen that kind of grew up together and, uh, they remained like a team, these on-air personalities, uh, and they went through changes over the course of time. And um, like any high school or any band, when you're together for that long, things are going to get a little complicated with personalities and egos. Um, I've heard... I, yeah, it's like, I don't know, it's like, tell, it's like talking shit at this point. <laughs> um, just him, it's him and Robert W. Morgan. Um, there was this uh, story where um, he was basically asked out of KHJ and had to work at, um, down in San Diego for about six months. Um, and my sisters just remember him really being just bummed out that he couldn't spend time with his family now. Like he had to drive all this way. And um, it was just due to politics. Um, and that's really a, was his first taste of something big city, was uh, this sort of big city kind of uh, on-air personality ego contest. <laughs> yeah, like, this, like this town is in Big enough for the two of us. A little bit, yeah. You know, they got so huge. Um, they even had a Thanksgiving Day float in the Rose, you know, or, no, I'm sorry. They got so huge, they even had a Rose, yeah, Rose Day, what was it, what's rose it called? Parade float. Right, it's on January 1st. Yeah, that's right, rose, the Rose Parade, yeah. They got even so huge, they even, They got so huge, they had their own Rose Parade float, which was crazy for personalities back in the day. Like, that was unheard of. Um, now, you, his personality, what developed his personality? You were, there are two things we were talking about when you first walked in mm. that you wanted to hit on. Mm. Those are good points. Uh, so, yeah, let me go back. Um, I said the best friend thing. There was something about rhythm and, oh, right, okay. Um, the one thing that I think these personalities, uh, let's see. I think the most important thing that these personalities had was the gift of conversation. They had this art to it where there was a rhythm, there was cadence, there was a beat, there's notes. It sounds just like a song when they're talking. They have this huge range because they have these great big voices and that's their instrument. And they're like a one-man band out there and it's crazy the amount of celebrity is just to talk for a living. The range, yeah, you just think of what this guy's palette was, right? And the yeah. vibrations that he's able to harness and, right. and, and 
and convert into right. like language. Yeah, it's mind boggling. He's got, you know, everybody's got one piano. This guy's got three of them. Yeah. You mentioned Michael Jackson. Yeah. What, what were some of the other, you know, uh, music groups or solo artists that your dad, you know, had that one degree of separation where oh, they were part of his life or he loved their music or they were his friend? He had, he had dinner with uh, George Harrison, which uh, I still, it's one of my favorite photos of all time. Um, it's just a great shot of him in the late 70s with uh, George at some banquet. But it's one of my favorite pictures. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, David Hasselhoff was a big friend in the 80s. Tommy Lasorda. Um, I remember visit, visiting Dodger Stadium getting all the, you know, VIP access in the 80s because my dad was just like, you know, Mr. Happening. <laughs> and, you know, I got to meet Tommy Lasorda and Oral Hershiser when he was just a rookie and um, all these great experiences that I don't think anyone else would have gotten to do um, that I knew of. Um, but it just seemed like he could do anything. You talked a little bit earlier about, what's his name, Bill Drake? Yeah. Was he, he was a program director? He was a program director, yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the influence that Bill Drake had on KHJ, your dad, the other jocks, and that influence that expanded beyond, you know, just that studio into Los Angeles and mm. the effect it had on, uh, on society? Mm. I think the mm, I think radio had to break at some point where personalities had to emerge. There had to be some egos back in the you know fifties, forties, you know. Uh, The catalyst, really, for on-air personalities was KHJ's program director, Bill Drake. He allowed these personalities to develop on their own. They weren't being told what to do. They weren't being told how to say it, or you know, an advertiser isn't telling them how to say things. It's, it's their own interpretation of uh, their energy and their voice. They're giving their own voice to words that um, represent, I'm trying to, I'm losing it, I'm losing it here, hold on. <laughs> um, let me see if I can rephrase that. He was smart enough to give them latitude to like just float their own creativity, which is kind of rare, right? Because everybody's afraid of their own job that they like let Somebody go right. too far. So he was, he was, I guess he was a rare, um, uh, a rare record, uh, or a rare radio manager. Well, I think someone had to take risks back in the 60s when there was just a, all this amazing music coming out. There was a revolution, not just on TV or the radio, but in the world. There was a war going on. Uh, people were... Uh, just upset at the government. Um, they needed someone to talk to. They needed someone to tell them what to listen to. Like, just immerse yourself in this art form that's readily available everywhere and check it out. These guys, because they're cool, because they say cool things, they get to tell you what to listen to. And they get to basically say, look, check this out. This is the coolest, this is the coolest thing you'll ever listen to right now. And now, and today, you could just type it in. Or, you know, you, you, you could search for whatever you want nowadays and it'll give you recommendations and automated responses. But this was human interaction at its finest, at its most simplest form, which was just voice. It was just uh, 
it was voice and music. And I don't think there's anything more important to a person's soul than either of those things. Right, because then you, you're, that you're, makes sense. the human connection was all intact and greased and operating in such a way that it never formed in that in that manner it's it was it was the beginning of something new yeah yeah no he 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 created with his other buddies of the same ilk especially in LA it's it created what you know what what turned out to be the the greatest kind of musical explosion um, on the planet yeah it was just the right place at the right time for my dad you know it was uh, unbelievable timing and I think one of the first uh, few days that he had on the air, um, or what, what, no, it was a, I'm thinking of another station. When was the Silmar earthquake? Do you remember that? Oh, Silmar was, uh, so, Silmar was 72. Uh, okay, so he had just signed on at KHJ in 1972, and he said these famous words, where he's like, I don't know what's going on, but I just kind of feel a little shaky this morning. And uh, during the song, I can't remember what song it was, but during the song, the Silmar earthquake hit and the needle skipped. This was a record player. You know, imagine a radio station using a record player. Like this was crazy back then. But you could hear the moment the earthquake hit, the needle just starts jumping and it goes wa it's like starts war warbling and um, but something about my dad's energy, he just he gave it all. He put it all out there. And I think he got it all back at the same time. He knew he was putting the performance out. Yeah. It was it was it was a game. He was in the game. Yeah. Yeah, wow. And how many years did he do it? What was his What was his span? Fifty two years, I think. Wow. Yeah, fifty two years of radio. That's incredible. That's incredible. Did he? Could he play an instrument? Mm, no, I never seen him play an instrument. Did he sing? Did he sing, or did he have? Did Poorly. He have <laughs> no, he was okay. Did he? Did he have? Um, did he, what, was his, what was his favorite music? What do you like listening to? He loved the Beatles. Uh, that was his favorite band. I remember being a kid in Chuck E. Cheese, and this is when Chuck E. Cheese used to play cool music, and Chuck E. Cheese was cool. Hope Chuck E. Cheese isn't, isn't a sponsor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but he, yeah, I'd, be play, I'd be playing video games in an arcade, and you know, it would just be me and him, and we'd just have like this father-son bonding time, and we'd hear wherever we were at in the arcade, we'd hear the Beatles playing over the loudspeaker and he'd just be like, you know, just right next to me, you know? And one of his favorite things to do was count off how many seconds it was from the start to when the lyrics hit, how many seconds uh, span that was. So you'd give him a song, right? And he'd say, you'd say like, uh, I don't know, heat of the moment or something like that, like 32 seconds. It's like that's how that's how much he knew about songs, and that's how much he invested his energy. Is he went so far as to actually know when to cut off his voice so the lyrics can start, and that was like one of his favorite art forms to ever perfect on the air, <laughs> which I'm still proud to relay to this day. <laughs> right. So when we, when we just said, did he like did he sing? This guy sang on more songs in the history of, you know, yeah. probably radio. Yeah, most imaginable, yeah. And, you know, I don't know how many other people he inspired. There's countless people that have messaged me on Facebook or emailed me. Um, but one of the most interesting ones was Howard Stern. Um, he used to, uh, there's a story out there, I can't remember where, he said this, but it's a quote where um, he used to do the call letters, like the jingle, you know, KHJ, and he'd like mimic my dad's voice and um, pretend that he was Charlie Tuna. And I think it was verified by a roommate at the time when he was 
uh, living somewhere um, in LA, but um, yeah, he's one of the, one of the guys I want to reach out to as well, um, just to see like what he knows about my dad because I never really heard him talk about him. Oh, you gotta know he knows him. I'm sure he was a direct influence. Yeah. You know, how couldn't he be? Yeah, but right. Howard, I think Howard was a really big fan of that generation as well, like that early 70s, late 60s radio. Um, it seems like a lot of people are fascinated with it, and um, someone should do something about it. What did your dad make of Hollywood? Um, hmm. I think my dad thought of Hollywood as something that wasn't for the weak. <laughs> you know, it spit you out, or it chewed you up and it spit you out, basically. Um, but if you led with integrity, you could get a lot of places. If you're grateful for where you are, if you are just happy to do your dream job, then that's a win in his book. And if you get paid for it, even better. You know, that was his motto. Yeah, because he knew something, right? He, he, he knew if he could survive in Hollywood, he could do a string of all these talk shows um, yeah. and, and the string of all these game shows. And, um, and here it is, you know, you could only do that if you have friends. You yeah. And the, the ability to make friends and influence people to give you a gig, I mean, I think he probably had so much ammo from his er early years that he was part of the culture. How could you yeah. give this guy a gig? Because yeah. He's going to only add to this show. He's like a good luck charm. I don't know for how many years he's been called legendary, but it's been... It seems like decades, even while he, even when he was still alive, it was just like, oh, the legendary Charlie Tune is back on KRS, you know, like uh, <laughs> um, 2006 is when he rejoined. And um, it's funny, actually, one of his co-workers that got canned the same day uh, in 2015, <laughs> this guy, uh, uh, Jay Gardner, um, he's a producer over there. Um, at k -Earth and I'm meeting with him on Sunday. So it's like all these things are starting, like all these weird things are starting to happen. I'm just kind of going with the flow, you know, just okay. taking it in stride and, you know, maybe there's something about 2020. But, uh, Did your dad feel lucky? I mean, he was really young when he came to KHJ. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was 22. Yeah, 22 years old. Imagine that. So he wasn't much older than the people that no. he was talking to on the radio. So. He really could relate to him. Did he ever talk about that feeling, you know, when he first got on in this big market? I mean, he came from Oklahoma City, I think, to come to L.A. Yeah, we, it, was, it was actually from Boston at that point. So, he, yeah, he, he ended up, um, gosh, I can't remember the exact trail. <laughs> but he went from Kearney to w Wichita to Oklahoma and to Boston, and I think he had a choice between L.A. and New York. And that's how he ended up out here, and then he was on various stations throughout the decades. But during that but, period yeah. of the 60s, I mean, that's when all of this stuff really took off. Did he ever talk about that time, how he felt? Did he feel lucky? Did he feel pressure to, you know, to make things happen because it was all happening around him and he had to, you know, run to catch up? Hmm. Um, I don't think he never mentioned anything like that. He, my dad, was always one of the guys that would drive to work late and then get there like what one minute to spare, and you'd be like, "Hi, this is Charlie Tuna," you know, like on the air. I don't know if you seen that movie L.A. Story, but there's like this great opening with Steve Martin in the car where he's just driving all over L.A. through alleys on people's yards and. Uh, he ends up like uh, like five minutes later at a parking space uh, for he's because he's he's a weatherman so um, but he walks right in puts on his jacket he's like ah sun 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 you know he's doing that um, but that that's just like that was just like my dad it was he got in his Cadillac in the morning um, I'm I'm not talking sixties but I'm kind of reminiscing a little bit but. Um, uh, yeah, anyways, um, but yeah, my, 
I think my father was just adaptable to any situation that he could be thrown at him. I mean, he he came up from a fairly rough childhood, and I think just being with his dream, living in his dream that he wanted to do since he was a little kid, uh, that was enough fuel for him to get through almost anything. Did he ever talk to you about the, the Manson murders? Mm. Because like you think about it, music, he was right there, he's in LA. And then yeah. How all those kind of things. I never, well. I never heard much about that. Yeah. I wish I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Manson. Um, what about what about uh, his political? What what what, what do you think of politics? Um. Politically, I think he was fairly neutral. I mean, he just wanted a good good people to do the right job health at the end of the day. I think he saw more um, uh, more acceptable human right behavior from the left a little bit more. You know, he loved Obama because Obama was just so charismatic. Uh, and he just, he loved the way that Obama flowed, <laughs> you know. Uh, um, just his presence and energy and just commanding leadership, uh, I think, uh, really, uh, he looked to that as something to aspire to and also to sort of role, um, sort of model after this, uh, you know, character isn't, uh, what's the right phrasing, hold on. Um, having character is just so important for my dad, you know. Well, yeah, because that guy exuded so much kind of, well, he could have made a good radio guy, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that had to have something to do with it. Yeah. Um, how was how was uh, how was his like nine to five? Just it, it, when he wasn't working, what what kind of guy was he when he wasn't working? And mm. I know you played sports with him and stuff. What was it? What was he? What was like a, an average day when it, we didn't have to go out sporting? Mm. Average day for my dad when he wasn't working was he would be in his back room working. <laughs> he would always be working. Um, if it wasn't uh, working, it was playing sports with me, it was watching sports. He loved The Simpsons. Um, uh, he loved late night shows. He loved watching talk, late night talk shows. You know, he loved um, Johnny Carson, loved David Letterman. Um, and uh, yeah, the, uh, he had to watch a lot of different programs for the next day. You know, he was preparing for the next day. In his days off, he was working for the future. I mean, he would never not work on something each day. That's how committed he was to his job. It was just unbelievable. When he was in the studio, did he just go off the cuff? Did he, was he so gifted that he could just have a note and then riff on it, or did he have like a prepared mm. point by point thing that he wanted to tick off during his three hour show? I think he definitely had notes um, that he wanted to hit. You know, he would research everyone before he would interview them, and um, he would just pick parts of their life that he thought the public would want to know. Um, and I think this goes all the way back to you know, the late 60s, early 70s, that KHJ era where he, he just learned to communicate with people um, in a big market in, in so many different ways. What were some of the things he didn't like? He didn't like? Yeah. He didn't, he didn't like the office politics, you know, the, uh, the favoritism. Um, of course, that happens everywhere, but um, that was just one of those things where, 
you know, it, it just comes with the business uh, of, of radio and um, I think just deals that didn't really go anywhere with different people for various reasons that tried to, I don't know, maybe mm, take more money than they should have, <laughs> those kind of things. I don't know how to carefully walk around that, but um, yeah, there was a few people that were uh, snakes in the grass, so to speak. Yeah, that's always a disappointment. Yeah. Um, were there any people that he disliked? Not really, I mean... Politicians, dictators? Yeah, I, oh God, I'm glad I didn't see Trump take off this, but... Um, <laughs> what, what, what would your dad think of Trump? Oh God, I don't know if I want to get into that. <laughs> uh, he would, I think he would say that, uh, uh, <laughs> he would say, uh, fame is a vapor, riches take wings, and only one, thing's, only one thing endures and that's character. That's what he would say. What did your dad like to eat? What was his like favorite food? <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, he loved he loved pizza Saturdays. <laughs> he loved he just loved I don't know. I mean, he just loved having a pizza. Um, but yeah, he 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 drove himself. He drove his body like he drove his car. <laughs> you know, he uh, didn't check the oil regularly. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, he just he would just go, go, go all the time. So he was just kind of, you know, Diet Pepsi in the morning and, you know, and uh, just really bad habits, uh, you know, uh, with food. But, um, yeah, love steak. You can't go wrong with a, a New York steak was his favorite, yeah. New York steak. Oh. Don't disagree with your dad there. Yeah. <laughs> Where would your dad be today if if he were here today? What would mm. what he be working on? Probably syndication deals. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities still out there for um, you know someone that has his voice that can you know deliver um, the right content to other people somehow. I don't know. Um, Would he be doing podcasts? I think we might have pushed him into podcasts. Um, it probably would have been maybe a self-sustainable operation where he could work from home, you know, um, where uh, me and my brother might have souped up his studio or something, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, he would probably just try to be as close to the grandkids as possible. Can you imagine if you let him loose, you actually got him? I wish I, my dad said, towards the end of my dad's life, he's like, man, I want to do a radio show. Yeah. You want to do a radio show? Yeah, okay. Well, I'll bring a recorder one day and we'll just do a record, <laughs> do a recording. He never did it. Uh, but he, wanted, he, wanted, he wanted to do podcasts way before podcasts. I didn't really have a vehicle for him. Wow, well, yeah. But he wanted to, he loved radio. Yeah, I find, it, I find it really interesting about now... And today we're going back to this long form conversation where it's uh, podcasts and it's just like old time radio again. And you have these, you know, it's something to put on in the background. Um, and it's not as long as a audio book. It's, it's something catered to personalities again. It all comes down to personalities. Like, who do you like? Who do you like listening to? Who likes, who asks the biggest questions that you're most interested in? Who are you most like out there? I mean, one of my, one of my go-tos right now is just the king of all podcasts, which is Joe Rogan. You know, he has uh, probably some of the most insightful questions out there and really big names to go along with it. I mean, he just had Bernie Sanders on. Um, uh, talking about his presidential run, you know, and this is a podcast. This isn't like something that is on television where it's these debates where you just kind of like have two minutes to say 
how you're going to change the world. You can't do that in two minutes. You need at least two hours to have a conversation about like, okay, well, what does this guy really think? And I think with this, with this increasingly fast culture, we're basically trying to slow down information as it's getting faster. So it's like some people are, I think, catching on and um, kind of taking a step back and going like, whoa, this whole social media thing isn't that cool. Like, what's cool is talking to people, right? Like, imagine, imagine that, you know, where you only had uh, a pay phone, uh, a phone that was connected to a wall where you had to like, you know, you couldn't bring it anywhere. You had to call to get your favorite radio. You had to call a number to get your favorite song to be played. You know, if you didn't have the record, uh, it was just, yeah, such a weird. It's it's weird how we're kind of going in this cyclical motion with media. It's an interesting, uh, interesting time to be alive. Did your dad save? of his radio shows? I mean, were there specific shows that were in his personal archives? Mm -hmm. I'm just totaling up in my head. I mean, 50 years at three hours oh, a yeah. day. He must have done upwards between 15 and 20,000 hours of radio. Yeah, we have, um, I think, bins like this big, full of just boxes of reels. Um, Do you have any from the KHJ years? Yeah, we found about 10 that we gave to Quentin's people that we got digitized. So we have digital copies of those. Well, that would be, we'd love to hear some of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, Quentin, when we went to the Grammy Museum, he brought your dad up. Oh, he did? Oh, yeah. No way. Yeah, no, he was talking about Charlie Tuna. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and how radio was, like, you know, it played such a big part in him. Wow, yeah, yeah, that's what I've heard. That's yeah. what I've heard. I would love to meet him one day. That would be so funny. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, if we I'm get sure him for an interview, we'll invite you that day. Oh my gosh, please. I would Just love to be here. To get him to. That'd be so great. Yeah, why did he do it, you know? We just have him talk about the film. It's so amazing. But yeah, I just, uh, it took me four years to even think about wanting to do anything with my dad's stuff, you know? Like, it was just so hard with the grief and um, it's a weird kind of grief too where you're not a celebrity but you had to deal with the celebrity status where you were getting calls from newspapers and and television you know being contacted left and right by family and it was just chaos and you can't expect a normal person to deal with something like that it's the downside of fame. It's just so fucking hard. And then the aftermath of still trying to keep his name and voice alive, you know, and um, the only way that I knew how that I could tolerate was just building up his Facebook and social media and just, you know, posting pictures of old um, uh, photographs that we had saved on the, on the computer. We still haven't gone through most of um, his stuff that's in the storage. It's just unbelievable how much stuff he has. It's at least a thousand pounds or more of tapes, cassette tapes. Um, he's got a lot of vinyl. He's got a lot of vinyl. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he literally saved everything, all of his notes, all of his notes from uh, what was on each tape, handwritten. Wow. It's just crazy. So if you could wrap up your dad's yeah. time in the 60s mm -hmm. and his impact on the 60s, do you, do you have a feeling of, you know, what that was, how he impacted through, I mean, did they give him the music to play? Did he make his own playlists? How did that all work? Did the DJs selected their own playlists back then. So the DJs played what they thought was, like, well, the singles that came out, they would play the singles, but they would play them in a certain order and have them lined up and, you know, with all the vinyl and everything. Um, I wish there was more video of inside the radio station back then. It'd be amazing.
Was there anybody that your dad singled, he launched them, and they became a star? Hmm. Yeah, was there any payola action that you know of that <laughs> dad ever talked about? <laughs> uh, hmm. Nothing, no one comes to mind. How about how music was changing in the 60s? I mean, it was going from, you know, the, the Bobby Vintons and those kind of guys to the Beatles and the Beach Boys and Hendrix and, you know, the psychedelic music yeah. and the war, the anti-war stuff with Joan Baez. Yeah. Did he play all of that or did he just focus on, because as a kid, right. I don't remember his playlist. I just remember, you know, listening to him because in 67, I was 12. <laughs> One of the things he, one of the things he bragged about about being at KHJ was being able to get away with playing the seven-minute version of "Light My Fire" <laughs> without advertisers getting all pissed. <laughs> he said, "Like that was, uh, you can't do that anymore." That kind of thing, you know. And he was kind of proud of that. Um, but yeah, the the music just transformed. And I think the music transformed society, and radio had to adapt somehow. And what better way to complement the freedom of this new music with the freedom of radio? You know, like uh, this freedom to have your own voice, your uh, own catchphrases, your own. Uh, promotional items, your um, own fans, you know, like that was never a thing before the 60s um, in radio. Um, but yeah, I just, I think it was just, that was just a huge cultural shift, especially right around Woodstock, you know, that was, there was so, there were so many events that happened back then that I think people just couldn't ignore. People had to talk and people were listening. Right, we went to the moon, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did he ever talk about the clubs, you know, the whiskey, a go go, or any of those clubs? Yeah, would he ever do those things like, you know, later, 80s, 90s? Or DJs would always be part of the club. They're like promoting the clubs and getting. Promoted. Yeah, I can't remember if there was. Uh, a uh, specific one or not? Uh, that'll be something my brother and sisters would know. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, like I said, I'm, I'm representing the family. I'm fi I'm doing my own research to find out like what my dad was like, you know, back then because I I don't know, and I'm I'm curious as well. Like I've only heard stories. I want to hear. I want to get a picture, you know. So. Well, as you discover more information, you know, yeah. you're always welcome back in that or another chair. That'd be great, yeah. And, uh, you know, you can, as we're moving forward and filling in this particular episode, maybe you can contribute some more stories as you find them. You know, Absolutely. Specific to the 60s. I want to uh, ask yeah. one, la one last sure. thing. Sure. What did, what did your dad think of uh, the drug culture? Oh, <laughs> My dad never did drugs, um, but everyone else did. <laughs> I mean, people were smoking pot in the station, left and right. I mean, this is the late 60s, so you got to think uh, Cheech and Chong kind of vibe, you know? <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, he stayed away from drugs just because of his own past with his... Uh, his, uh, his own father, you know, he uh, had uh, a tough relationship with his own father and vowed to never drink and he never did. And he uh, never did drugs either. So it was, wasn't, it wasn't him. And he just didn't like that lack of control. I think um, other people thrived on it. And I think that's what made him wacky. But he was a straight up professional through and through. And he was a I guess what you you would call a consummate professional. Wow, wow, that's, yeah, that's pretty a perfect amazing. way to end right there. Yeah. Yeah, he never drank, never did drugs. I, of course, do, but I, 
addiction skips a generation, I guess. <laughs> but um, yeah, my, I'm nowhere near my grandfather, but um, yeah, I've heard stories just, uh, yeah. He got out right at 18. Wow. Yeah. So he had to make his own way. Mm-hmm. He started in radio at 16, I read. Yep. He started doing stuff in his high school, like this little, that's what I want to mention. I don't think anyone really understands how shy my dad really is. Hold on, there's like a fuzz. You're not flying. <laughs> it was like a piece of fuzz that was oh. like kind of floating. Yeah, I don't, for a radio personality, I don't think people really understand how shy my dad is. Uh, this was a boy who hid behind his mom's skirt anytime he'd be introduced to strangers, you know, like, he's, he was the quietest one in high school, uh, but he was the radio announcer. He had this, this will to just do this job, no matter what was going to stop him. His, his shyness went out the window when he became someone on the radio. And I think um, that's why he loved having two names. He was both this private, shy, quiet family man, and he was also uh, this amazing voice that people couldn't get enough of and just felt comforted to hear every day. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, he had a split personality. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Totally. And do, do you think, did he like being Arthur Ferguson? Yeah, he did. More than he liked being Charlie Tuna? Or was Charlie Tuna just uh. Arthur Ferguson? In the radio? <laughs> I, uh... I mean, how much of Charlie Tuna was <laughs> an act, his persona, and how much of it was really who he was? Well, I think, um, you know, if there's anyone to uh, compare my dad to, it has to be Superman. You know, he came crash landing into somewhere in middle America, in Kearney, Nebraska. Probably crawled out of a rock somehow, alive as a baby. And got picked up by these two, <laughs> two older people. <laughs> and that became his parents. And he was an only child, you know. He was the only child and he escaped this... Uh, this, this home situation and made the life that he wanted to be and became Charlie Tuna. He became like this uh, superhero in a way where he felt I think nothing could really touch him in that regard. Can you just, let's finish on this, can you just touch on, uh, I read something about he, he took over for somebody on the radio, mm -hmm. and that guy had been Charlie Tuna for about a week. Yeah. Is that, is that a, can you talk about how he got the name Charlie Tuna? Um, I can't remember his name. I think it was somebody named Riley? Uh, Chuck Riley. Chuck Riley, like that. that's right. Okay. So this is, yeah, this is back in Oklahoma, I believe. Um... I forgot the call letters. It was uh, KOMA, Coma. Um, yeah, so he was at Coma at the time, and Chuck Chuck Riley was there, and you know his name's Chuck, and he decided one day after drinking a lot of alcohol <laughs> uh, that he would just go on the air as Charlie Tuna because he saw those Starkist ads on TV, and he was like, you know, it'd be funny to be like a different guy tomorrow. And then, uh, so he did it as a goof one day. And then um, my dad followed him as the next Charlie Tuna without telling anyone. <laughs> so for a while, people didn't know which Charlie Tuna was which. And um, then he later had a poll on the radio and asked like, well, this is Art Ferguson do you guys like the new Charlie Tuna or do you like Art Ferguson better? Like, you know, call in and let me know. And overwhelmingly, people didn't like my dad's real name. <laughs> didn't have the ring to it, you know? Did he ever, did he ever talk about Charlie Tuna, the, 
the, the fish guy? Oh, yeah. I mean, throughout his career, he was bombarded with uh, various swag from Starkist, and they didn't have a problem with the name at all. They thought it was uh, adorable, and, you know, they couldn't have wished it on a better uh, voice, you know? <laughs> free advertising. Yeah, basically. Did, did he do a Charlie Tuna impression? No. Did he ever meet Herschel Bernardi, who was the uh, I don't know. first Charlie Tuna? I don't know. That would be interesting. The cartoon Charlie Tuna. Charlie yeah. Tuna Charlie Tuna. Yeah, that would have been, uh, that would have been That's funny. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know the, the history with that. Uh, that's something well, I want to find out. Something else for you to research. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I need a copy of this. That's an interesting <laughs> chapter in your book about yeah. how Charlie Tuna got his name. Absolutely, yeah. Have you ever met the, the Charlie Tuna that did the voiceovers in the commercials yeah. and stuff? Yeah. They should have, when Herschel Bernardi died, I forget who the actor was they hired to take his place, but they should have hired your dad. <laughs> that would have been great, Tuna yeah. Charlie Tuna. That would have yeah, been so funny. That would have been a great PR move. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been working the uh, advertising agency. He, he earned it, right? But yeah, K-Big went really hard in the late 2000s with the promotional items and all the Star Kiss stuff. And they even had, I think it was like a picture, they had like a full-on guy dressed up in the, in the suit of Charlie Tuna, like a big stuffed, you know, fish, shark, <laughs> and he had to fit in the office, in the, in the booth somehow. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, yeah, a long time ago. So, uh, any, any other questions, I think? What was your dad's middle name? Wiley. Arthur Wiley Ferguson, named after my father, my grandfather. So he didn't like his middle name, or he did? No, he he. I mean, he, he would sign to Arthur W. Ferguson, but his signature is just so crazy. <laughs> I don't know how anyone could read it. <laughs> Signed it like a doctor. Yeah, pretty much. I don't know where he learned to do that, but his. It's so funny when you look at his handwriting from like high school. It never changed. It never changed throughout his whole career. It was just unbelievable. He was an English major um, growing up in uh, going to high school. So he wanted to be a writer. He wanted to be a, a, a writer somewhere, like either books or entertainment, something like that. Well, why uh, was it that he never did write his own autobiography? He loved the sound of his own voice too much. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, he had a gift, I think. I think people just naturally told him, like, you should be on the air. Like, why aren't you on radio? He wrote his own autobiography, but it's on those thousands of right. pages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, had, you know, I had to and, decode him. you come across, I mean, you said you got the stuff digitized from, from Terrence. It's only like 10 out of like 10,000 or something. Anything else and any pictures of you. Oh, yeah, like absolutely. The birds or Jan and Dean or the Beach Boys or any of the people from the 60s. Uh, 